and the King, a comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us, and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls of good. Well, good, e good evening, everyone. Let's be, by the grace of God, joined together again for our Orthodox Faith and Life class. Uh, we've reached now the 13th discourse from, from Abba Dorotheos. And again, I think a very timely one for, for us this year. And, well, for not always. But it's entitled, On Enduring Temptation, Calmly and Thankfully. And as I just reflecting on, the, on that title, Boy, this is this is the lesson for this year, or this whole time of our life, or if anything, because as we'll see in the reading a little farther, so much of why we suffer, so much you know, you could say, of a suffering not according to God, is because we don't endure. We don't endure with courage, and just calmly with trust in God. And because of that, we have all kinds of internal turmoil, all kinds of negative feelings and emotions which we don't we wouldn't have to have uh, we'll, we'll get into this but it's a really uh, I think important topic for how do we just approach things in our life and also just by way of introduction again was reflecting on conversations I've had recently with people as, you know, as, a, as, a, as a parish priest here um, the past months but sometimes you'll find that you may have as well that People sometimes have assumptions about how you think about certain things when you get into a conversation. I've often found that uh, in conversation, someone may just assume because of who, who I am or, or, or for whatever reason, that I hold certain political views or that I hold certain views in relation to psychology or how we to approach the person or a situation or, or how ought we ought to think about something for one reason or another. And what's striking to me very often is because, of course, when, when it's correct, it doesn't really, or it kind of aligns with that I don't really notice it so much. I think it's, I notice it more when there it does feel like this disconnect between how I would approach the situation, how it feels like somebody's assuming that I would approach a situation, um, is that the way we look at any situation from as an Orthodox Christian isn't, isn't light of the cross. And it's very often other than whether it would, whatever political party might approach it, uh, whichever side you're on, very different from how you know, uh, more secular psychology might approach might approach things. Um, we would say as Christians, we sometimes call it the true philosophy, philosophy of the deepest sides, probably still different than what you'd find in most philosophy departments. But in the sense of, the, of a deeper wisdom, a wisdom not of this world, revealed only by God, and hence it does not always make sense. Uh, if we're looking at things according to worldly values, according to, um, you could say, the, com the common sense, the common wisdom of, of, of the age or the culture, um, what have you. So that's my introductions. We'll get into how do we look at things in terms of the cross of Christ for this, of this chapter. But as we do open it up, if there's any uh, other thoughts, reflections from last time or other things that you wanted to ask before we uh, jump into this week? I was just thinking as as you were talking about, you know, looking at our own uh, values as they differ from that of the world. And, uh, you know, as I grow in the church and learn more, read more, talk more, I, I'm constantly being forced to look at things I believe and things I think and there's the process and it initially I might think oh well I I disagree on that I believe this and then as I grow and read more and, and dwell on it I it starts to go with that process of well how do I rectify that I believe something is different from here and then as I grow more and more then I get to stepping back and realizing especially when you're reading a book a lot of the monastics that have to focus on uh, looking at things without the ego, looking yes. at your own life in third person and seeing that um, 
well, of course the church and I disagree, or that the correct, what, what I can read the Bible and the writings and see is the correct conclusion, is different from my own, and how to look at that and say, okay, well, it's me that's wrong. I've been wrong, and understanding that through my own pride, I just held on to that belief, either because it benefited me or because it was mine. This is my belief. This is what makes me me. I can't mm -hmm. let it go. Yes, then God bless you. It takes, it takes great humility to be able to um, to be open to, to, to hear that, that witness. But I think as, we, as we, we, come in, we come into the church, we have some experience of the truth of it, some revelation. But a lot of our, um, you could say, presuppositions do get challenged. And I think we should let them let them be challenged to really force ourselves to hear because otherwise we can't go through that process. Some of the things we held before are true indeed and will be reaffirmed and others very much have to be uh, transformed or, or kind of reformed, if you will. Um, and if we don't, if we don't allow that process to happen, uh, we can, we can kind of get it, get into trouble to give, but, but one, one example of what I was referring to, and since it's fitting with the commemoration of the prophet Daniel, um, in the, in, the, in the way the world commonly thinks, right, we should always do things by force. You've got to fight for what's right, right? You know, to, to the end. And yet, when you read it, we read, uh, to take, I'll take a couple examples from the history of, of God's people of Israel. Uh, God had allowed the Babylonians uh, to, to capture, uh, burn Jerusalem because of the people's sins. This was, of course, as, as Jeremiah was telling them things they did not want to hear, that you know, submit to this captivity and don't resist it because this is essentially uh, your penance for having turned away from the Lord for so long. So they're in, so they're in at the time of the prophet Daniel and the three holy use. They're they're in slavery. They're captive to a pagan uh, people, a, god, a godless empire. And how does God deliver them? Does He stir them up to form a revolution? No, actually. God commands them to keep the faith, right? To stay faithful when it's, no matter how hard it was, even to the point sometimes of being, being willing to give one's life as we saw. And yet in God's time, after 70 years of captivity, he delivers the people of, of Israel through another foreign power, completely outside of, you know, outside of, outside of themselves. Uh, even to go back to, to a further event, to the, the slavery in Egypt, um, I mean, at the time of Moses, I think it was very, what's very striking about that is that God doesn't stir things up in terms of a, a political military uh, revolution in that way, but it makes it very clear in the Bible that God himself delivered the people with a mighty hand, uh, and that it was completely the, the work of God. And so, with, with all of this, I think it comes to the perspective that we'll see Ours is to remain faithful, ours is to, uh, to endure, to hold the faith, but so much of the external circumstances cannot harm us. Sometimes it's harder to be a Christian when things are very comfortable and easy. The temptation to fall away into a worldly way of living is actually easier than when, it's, um, when external circumstances are a little bit more difficult. Perhaps that's one of the, been the big blessings of this year, if you, could, if you could put it that way, is that it's not been so easy to be a Christian. It's not been so easy to practice our faith the way that we were, were accustomed to it. Um, we've had to work for it in ways that we've, we've not. And, and so through that can come, uh, if, if we take it in the right spirit, and that's kind of the theme, a lot of blessings can come. I'm wondering too, like kind of going back to what Dan was saying about the whole thing and basically like conforming our thoughts to the mind of the church. Um, maybe it's a question, maybe it's a statement, but that probably takes our whole lives, right? Just in that we're, as we're coming into the church, it's like we're not necessarily shown all at once all the things that are <coughs> important with our thinking, the way the church thinks. But over time, like God reveals that to us and we're, we're continually like repenting and trying to bring that in line. Well, well this is right, as you're, as you're touching on it, is if you link it to the broader sense of our understanding of repentance, of being conformed to the image of Christ, of, of becoming like unto God, 
of repentance is a constant um, change, a constant turning away from that which has fallen and being conformed unto uh, unto Him. And so it is. And what is Saint Paul saying in Romans somewhere? Be be transformed through the renewing of your mind, or, or your new That it's it is it is a it is a, it is a lifelong process. But nonetheless, one that has, you could say, has, has, has stages that we've never, we're always r running the race. And um, as many of the Holy Fathers say too, to, to keep ourselves humble, to always see ourselves as beginners, as not experts who are in a place to be teaching others. Be very careful about this. If you, you know, as uh, James, uh, the Apostle James really cautions, do not let many of you be, be teachers because there'll be much, uh, much heavier uh, judgment that one will have to answer for. Um, so, kind of in, in all humility, we, we continue to learn. I continue to, to, to learn and to um, and be, be inspired by, by all of these things as, we, as, as life goes on. Okay, so, without any more, why don't we ju ju jump in? And actually today I had brought my reading glasses so I can would not be jumping quite so much as usual. So how Dorotheus begins, his 13th discourse. His Abba Pullman, who was one of the Desert Fathers, used to say very accurately that the signs of a true monk make their appearance in the time of temptation. Or couldn't we say the sign of a true Christian makes it appear in the time of temptation? Another side, a lot of ways in difficult times are a revelation. This year is a revelation of all of us. It reveals what's inside. It reveals... Uh, uh, yes. And it can say a lot because how we respond to the difficult things, um, you know, we don't, don't despair, but it is, but it, is a, it, it does help to um, bring these things out, both the good and the bad, or the, the good and that which is still in need of redemption <laughs> or transformation, so say it more positive. <laughs> For a monk truly setting out to serve our Lord must be wise enough to prepare his soul for temptations. Likewise must a Christian, right? Lest he at any time become estranged from the Lord or be overwhelmed by what comes upon him. He must believe that nothing happens apart from God's providence. In God's providence, everything is absolutely right. And whatever happens is for the assistance of the soul. For whatever God does with us, he does out of his love and consideration for us because it is adapted to our needs. We ought, as the Apostle says, in all things to give thanks for his goodness to us, and never to get fed up or become weak-willed about what happens to us, or to accept calmly with lowliness of mind and hope in God, whatever comes upon us, firmly convinced, as I said, that whatever God does to us or for us, he always does out of goodness, because he loves us. And he always does what is right. Nothing else could be right for us but the way in which he mercifully deals with us. I'm going to add a little caveat on the bigger theological side because what Abba Dorotheos is, is talking about here, and as we've seen in some of the lectures, other, other discourses, is how do I best take these things in a Christian way? If you're going to get a, a deeper level of God's uh, both God's providence and care in the world, but also God's allowance for human freedom, right? God, we don't believe in a God who micromanages and controls every single situation and action. God is not the puppet master. Uh, we are allowed freedom to help and to harm each other in this world. And yet there is a sense in which, uh, in God's providence and care, that the circumstances that we encounter are are allowed are allowed by him and that he does not allow us to um face more than we can more than we can endure from his grace and that the circumstances we do encounter in our life can be for our salvation so that's does that make sense um so say if you, if you read some of this without the the fuller context you might get a, a wrong impression of of, of our, our theology but if you see the full picture of how uh, both this deep trust and commending ourselves to God's providence in every situation is also held together with a um, with a, a, a deep understanding of, of human freedom and all of its 
in all of its beauty and in all of its uh, uh, fearful misuse at times as well. I, I actually, when I first started reading this, and the first thing, the adversary, was right here. Mm -hmm. Because I have several friends that it wasn't anything that they did, but things that were done to them as children. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, okay, I have to take this for me. This is not a theodicy trying to say that everything happens in the world. Is, is God working it to good? Um, he's allowing things to happen sometimes to our freedom because some of the stuff, you know, like child abuse, and, and yes. so, and we're talking severe child abuse. I have a couple of friends that are still like PTSD and, and things like that. Because mm -hmm. that, that's the first thing I thought is like the way it's worded is like, so he allowed, he made that happen, and so. Yes, and we don't want, we don't want to take it away. God, God just takes no pleasure in that. God, God of course, yes. <laughs> sin and of course, what could be worse than than, uh, than sin against a child? This comes from as we've talked in the other discourses that mi that misuse of that God given freedom uh, that we have, and fortunately, we, we we are we are allowed as free beings to um, to do good in the likeness of God or or the or the opposite, but. What he's, what the, the sense of which he's trying to take this, speaking to uh, his, the brother monks gathered around, in, a, in an analogous way as we're gathered around here, is saying well, the, the events that come your way every day, the hard stuff especially, take it in a way that God is allowing this for your salvation. Don't try to fight against it. I want it to be some another way. When we get a little farther, we see that this is the root of why we're so miserable and unhappy all the time. Is that... I want circumstances to be a different way. I want it to be the way I want it to be. And consequently, when it's not, I get upset. I have no peace, and I also don't grow spiritually. I don't, I don't encounter God. Um, and all of the, oh, this is for you. Yep, that's for you. So, very good. I think we'll, we can come back to that later if need be. So, continues on page 192 at the bottom. If a man has a friend who is absolutely certain that his friend loves him, and if that friend does something to cause him suffering and be troublesome to him, he will be convinced that his friend acts out of love, and he will never believe that his friend does it to harm him. How much more ought we to be convinced about God who created us, who drew us out of nothingness to existence and life, and who became a man for our sake and died for us, and who does everything out of love for us? It's conceivable that a friend may do something because he loves us and is concerned about me, which in spite of his good intentions does me harm. This is likely to happen because he doesn't have complete knowledge or understanding of my needs and my, what my destiny is. But we cannot say the same about God. He is the fountain of wisdom and he knows everything that is to my advantage. And with this in view, he arranges everything that concerns me without counting the cost. Yeah, I so again, that continues that introductory thought as we said um take it in the right measure but as we but if we meet the events in our lives with the spirit we can meet them in a way in which we can grow encounter god become virtuous and not be um and not be conquered by the the negative passions within us there's a there's a prayer of, of the in many of the prayer books of the Optina elders, which expresses the same spirit of some of you may have may have seen, which is again I say if you if you take it too far in the wrong way, you can end up in a theologically incorrect way. But that's not the way that it's intended. O um, oh Lord, grant that I may meet all of this coming day brings me with spiritual tranquility. Grant that I may fully surrender myself to Thy holy will, and every hour of this day direct and support me in all things. Whatsoever news may reach me in the course of this day. Teach me to accept that all that comes down, uh, that, that, all, that all is sent down from the, um, no, I'm getting a little muddled, but um, it kind of goes in that spirit of just you know, to teach me to pray, to believe, to hope, to be patient, to forgive, and to love. So in this idea that in every circumstance, no matter how easy or difficult, that we commend it to God and we sort of em embrace it, embrace the struggle, the challenge um, and to be faithful in it. Let's skip down a little bit more to the bottom of 193 here. 
said, God does not allow us to be burdened with anything beyond our power of endurance. This has this in the epistles as well, in St. Paul somewhere. Is that? Um, and therefore, when difficulties come upon us, we do not sin unless we are unwilling to endure a little tribulation or to suffer anything unforeseen. So the sin comes when we're unwilling to endure a little tribulation or, or suffer a little. As the apostle says, God is faithful and will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able to endure. So there, there we go. And the reference is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But we are men and we have no patience and no desire for a little labor. Yeah. Oh, true. True. And no desire to brace ourselves to accept anything with humility. Therefore, we're crushed by our difficulties. And the more we run, run away from temptations, the more they weigh us down, and the less we're able to, be, to drive them away. So then, he uses a beautiful example uh, that those from California can relate to, I hope. How many of you have ever uh, been in the ocean? Raise your hand. Okay, I think most of you have. So you had some experience with waves. Yes, the big waves, right? And if you ever, when you're trying to go out with your, your boogie board or you know, whatever it is, that you, your surfboard, or you're just going out in the water, and you've got these big waves coming, what happens if you try to go straight at the wave? Is it easy or difficult? It's pretty hard. It's pretty be pretty difficult, especially if they're big. You might get kind of thrown back a bit. They might splash on you. Um, you got the current to contend with. But what do you do if you want to get 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 out there a little more easily? What do you do with the wave? Do I try to go over it or do I try to go under it? Go under it. You just put your head under water. You swim. You take a little stroke, and you come right out on the other side of the wave. No sweat at all. And, and so it's a uh, interest. So Ava Dorotheus must have done some swimming before, because he uses this analogy. He says. Um, about the wave, the one who has the humility to humble themselves, to go under that under that big wave and just to ride through it, endures all of these hard sh situations with peace of spirit. We don't have to, if we just humble ourselves a little bit to go kind of under that wave, then we don't have to be so upset. We're not fighting against it with all our strength. We're not um, kind of using all of our energy to try to change the situation to try to, um, I don't know, affect something we have no control over anyway. I can't change anybody else, right? But I can decide how I'm going to respond to a situation. And this is where he talks about that spirit of, of kind of, of, de of descending with, with humility, uh, so that those who work on doing this, work this way when they are in trouble, putting up with the temptations with patience and humility, and so they come through unharmed. But if they get distressed and downcast, seeking the reasons for everything, tormenting themselves and being annoyed. Do we ever do that? Why, why, why? I'm so upset, <laughs> you know. Uh, instead of helping themselves, they do themselves harm. I think that's what we have to realize, is that when we... Um, Sometimes they could say the temptation to overanalyze every situation, other people. Um, I don't have to solve the mystery of every other person in my life, especially the difficult ones, right? I can just ex I can just accept them, and I can work on my own response. Am I, am I going to allow myself to to get upset and to react, or can I just keep keep my peace and? turn to God when it's difficult, when it, when it hurts, um, but to have courage and to go forward. So it's that, that sense of humility. I don't have to get pulled into it, and I don't have to try to, as I say, change all my circumstances. So continuing in 194, he says, if painful experiences crowd in upon us, we ought not to be disturbed. Allowing ourselves to be disturbed by these experiences is sheer ignorance and pride because we're not recognizing our own condition. As the fathers tell us, we're running away from labor. We make no progress because we've not squarely taken our own measure, and we do not persevere in the work we begin, and we want, and we want to acquire virtue without effort. This is what it's, the, the, this is one thing we come back to, which I think is as true today as it was then, right? We, we want the easy path. <laughs> uh, you know, I want to, I 
I don't know, maybe just read a book or maybe now the YouTube video and, and be a saint. <laughs> and shouldn't that be as, as much as it is? But no, it's a lifelong, a lifelong process of, of repentance and, and work. And, uh, okay. Say that one special prayer and then you're a saint forever mm -hmm. or whatever. So. Yeah, so, you know, how many, I don't know, maybe, maybe Maybe not 300, maybe if you do 3,000 Jesus prayers, you're going to be a saint. And, you know, so, so get on it as fast as you know. But, it's, but it takes effort. It takes um, a lot of patience, a, a lot of patience and many years. And when we have that perspective, it can help us not to get, not to get discouraged. Because really, I mean, one thing with this year, too, is it's been a, such a hard struggle for all of us. It's really, you know, only... I don't know, okay, maybe ten, ten, 10 months now or something, nine months, feels which like is a lot. Years. Yeah, it feels like nine years. <laughs> it really does. But in the, in the scale of, of things and hardships that one can encounter in one's life, I mean, I, I don't even know that I could begin to compare this with what it must have been like to live through one of the world wars. And for those for those years of hardship, or what it would be like to go through the Great Depression, um, not to minimize the situation, but it's just some of us we have no, we just don't have patience as modern people to um, to help us through the, the hard times. So so why should an emotion why should an emotional man find it strange if he's disturbed by his emotions? <laughs> so we say we're, we're kind of you know we're emotional. We're not you know we're not healed of all of our. Uh, you know, internal turmoil. We haven't overcome all of our passions. So why should we be surprised if we're struggling? Um, so don't, so don't, don't get upset about that. Why should he be overwhelmed if he, if he sometimes gives way to them? And so you sometimes fall. Don't, don't, don't give up. Don't be overwhelmed. It's gonna happen. But keep, keep going. That's something that's taken me a while. Still works on that is uh, you know when I do feel myself overwhelmed, just fighting betters to say, oh, you'll never, you'll never make it. Why are you even trying if you fell this easily mm -hmm. today? Or yes, and, you know, and God bless you because that is really um, temptation of the devil to make it all or nothing, and he knows that we can't do it all at once. So it's this: if you can't do everything perfectly, you may as well just not try. It's, it kind of reminds me of um, an attitude toward, toward Lent that I had encountered you know, outside the Orthodox Church you know, growing up at times. It would be like the idea of, an, okay, I'm going to give this thing up for Lent. And I'm going to give up chocolates. Well, on the, on the second week, I ate a chocolate. And so, well, it's better to just throw the whole thing out now because I, you know, I didn't make it. So why bother for the rest of Lent? It's so different than an orthodox perspective that if you fall once get back up and keep going if you fall again get back up and start again if you fall 10 times in the day get back up repent and start again because it is this whole motion of effort not that we not that we want to fall not that we kind of accept that as going to oh i'm just gonna because you don't want that thought either oh i'm just gonna sin again no start again <laughs> with an attitude that at least for the next 10 minutes, the next hour, for the next day, little by little, right? You don't want to run your whole life out. Just start with the next step, the next time when we begin again and all of this. So a little aside, but it's, but also we realize if we do kind of fall a little bit or fail, that's just part of the process. We, when we struggle, when we, when we're, would, if we're not at peace with that, then that means we're alive, as we said before. Because somebody who's spiritually dead, it doesn't care. If we've numbed our conscience so much that we just don't care if we sin, then that means we're not alive. If we fall, but we, we feel remorse and we want to begin again, then we're alive. We're being saved, as we said. And that's the, and that's the really salvific motion going on inside of us. Does that all make sense? So he says, you have, you have them inside yourself, and you're disturbed when you break out. You have the seeds in you, and yet you ask, why do they spring up and trouble me? 
much better to have patience and go on struggling with them and beg God's help. So we have patience, we go on struggling, we ask for God's help. It is impossible for someone struggling against his evil desires not to suffer afflictions from them. And so he goes on to give some examples here. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Is one of the um, uses different analogies from the Old Testament, kind of in an allegorical sense here. And he describes that time, um, he's referring to the prophet Hosea, where um, people of, I believe this is related, he says Assyrians, but I think this is relating to the time of the Babylonians, perhaps someone can, um, I guess Hosea would have been the Assyrians, but they wanted to, is the Assyrians, yeah, so, and so he's, they're wanting to go get help from the Egyptians. And is the historical circumstance to fight against the Assyrians who were invading. And he reads this in an allegorical way where Prophet Hosea says, Search, he went in search of Egypt and was taken by force by the Assyrians. And he says, By Egypt the fathers understand the bodily inclinations to be at rest, which teaches us to set our minds on pleasure and soft living. Kind of it jumps back at other times before the idea of when the people of Israel had first left Egypt in the, in the Exodus, um, there was this idea of even though they were enslaved in Egypt, it was kind of comfortable. They had the flesh pots, you had the uh, leeks, leeks and you know, they, had, they had some nice food. And so it was a little rough. They were enslaved, but, you know, it had its upsides, too. There was some, ple there was some pleasantness. And there was often when things were difficult in the desert that period, they would you know, sometimes start mumbling, you know, um, murmuring against God, wanting to go back. And it's a similar situation here, interprets it as Egypt being setting our minds on pleasure and soft living. And yet what happens is by Assyrians we understand passionate and grossing thoughts which trouble and confuse the mind and fill it with unclean images and carry the unwilling mind forcefully towards sinful acts. And so he's making, the, he, he makes the kind of the, the interpretation here, it could be, whether it's a little forced or not, it's, <laughs> it's a real illustration to show that we don't we're not going to be able to get free of those, of those really, those passionate thoughts, the the vices that are in us, by by seeking the easy way, by seeking the life of pleasure, by basically trying to get the Egyptians to fight our battle for us. <laughs> and he said, like, no, we're going to have to take some courage, and 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 settle in for the for the long struggle. If we really want to do this, that's that's the way we have to go forward. So if therefore a man willingly gives himself up to bodily pleasures, he will of necessity be led unwillingly by the Assyrians and forced to serve Nebuchadnezzar. Knowing this, the prophet was troubled and kept on saying, do not go down into Egypt. Okay, so he kind of, he carries that, that um, some of that, that imagery a little bit farther again. I'm going to go on to page 196, where he says, they, they willingly became Pharaoh's slaves and soon they were taken by force to the Assyrians and made their unwilling slaves. So in the, the example, so they, they chose to place themselves under the slavery to try to have the Egyptians fight their battle for them, taking the easy route. Then they unwillingly became slaves to the Assyrians, uh, which he here interprets as all of the kind of the sinful uh, vices or passions that are more deeply rooted within us. So he writes, fix your attention on what has been said. Before a man gives way to his passions, even if his thoughts mount an assault against him, he is always a free man in his own city, and he has God as an ally. So this is where, so you are, before we're, we're tempted, we're, you know, we're a free person, a free man or woman in our own city, and we've got God as our ally. So we continue this metaphor uh, here from scripture. Let's go. If therefore, he humbles himself before God and bears the yoke of his trial and affliction with thanksgiving and puts up a little fight. The help of God will deliver him. But if he flees labor and goes, bodily, and goes after bodily pleasures, then he will necessarily be led into the land of the Egyptians and without wishing it become their slave. And it, go, it, it goes on again uh, for some time. Uh, jumping a little farther, he writes, As someone who, whether or not he understands that the cause is in himself, 
or in his present circumstances, believes that nothing from God is indiscriminate or unjust. So this is the same, if we take it in this spirit, um, that we see the present, that either the cause is from my, myself or the circumstances are allowed by God for my salvation. He says, such a brother who mourned and wept when God removed his temptation so he's saying this is the spirit we should have uh, and he describes some of the some brothers here he who said lord i am unworthy to endure a little am i unworthy to endure a little affliction so he describes the monk who things were going easily for him and he said and he thought this isn't you know am i unworthy of that because it's it is through afflictions that we become we become sanctified right not that and that's not necessarily the easy thing that we want to hear and again, there is the account of a disciple of one of the great uh, monks of old who was severely attacked by a spirit of fornication. And the master seeing this said to him, do you want me to beg God to, to lighten this attack? But the disciple said, even if I'm hard pressed, I see there is great fruit coming to me from the labor. Rather ask this of God that he give me endurance. This is sometimes you, you see in a number of the lives of the saints and the truly um, you know, holy men and women that rather than asking to be healed of their illness or delivered from a temptation, they ask for patience and endurance. Uh, they ask for God's grace and strength um, to remain faithful through that. Not to say that you, you couldn't, and that it's um, and that there are others who, who, who do. It's it's just seeing this is that this is that higher path. Um, you sometimes you sometimes come across this. Like, examples in, in you know, other monastic books but there's one, one account of a holy elder who says that we we, we pray we, we pray for the for, for God to heal the lay people who come but for us we accept that we accept the illnesses and ask and we pray for God's uh, grace to help us patiently endure them um, you know however you want to take it but it's seen as this is a this is a spirit in which we embrace the cross this is a very, as I say, this is a very hard word. This is not the wisdom of this world. This is neither, this is neither a Democrat nor Republican or psychology nor anything else. It sounds crazy to everyone. And yet this is the way of, this is the way of the cross. And so we, I'm going ahead a little bit farther to 197. He writes, when someone struggles courageously against committing sin and begins to fight against the thoughts that attack his mind, he humbles himself and endures a buffeting, and yet struggles on. And on this account, he is soon cleansed and returns to what is in accord with his nature. So this is the, the image of one who is really enduring a Christian spirit. Hum we humble ourselves, we endure and we give thanks, we struggle on. And it's those, th those things, right, patience and gratitude in the midst of it, that can really carry it carry us through because what's the what's the benefit of gratitude here is that when things are hard if we can still give thanks it can really transform a situation i think we we're talking about this recently right things that are seem all dark can become light we notice that it's not all it's not all bad um i think it was when we were talking about the akathis glory to god for all things on thanksgiving that was written in, in the depths of a period of deep persecution um, you know, by somebody who had spent time in the gulags and who knew what it was to be deprived and still found all this beauty in God's creation and God's providence and his care. If we have that, that attitude to be able to give thanks to God, even in afflictions, the burden doesn't feel so heavy. It doesn't have to be so crushing. That is something which is a product of grace, how the cross transforms. Um, how it brings joy it's not a truly a christian ascetic isn't somebody who's downcast and dour all the time in fact if you ever have the chance to uh, to meet you know some of these very 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 spiritual people if you will whether they're monk or nun or, or maybe they're they're, they're somebody you know, here in the parish or they're they're usually in a quiet time but they have such joy that's what's what's striking is that they don't have any easy, easier life per se, but in the midst of it, they, they find joy. And that's also an asceticism and part of 
being able to endure uh, these situations with, with faith in God, with trust, with gratitude, um, and all of that. So, going off on a, a little aside here, continues, whereas, as we were saying, from his ignorance and pride, a man is overcome when he's beset by his unruly passions. He ought, after the humiliation of falling, all the more correctly to take his own measure and continue praying until God pours out his mercy upon him. For unless a man is tempted and sees the troubles which uncontrolled passions cause him, he will not at any time fight to be cleansed of them. About this the psalm says, As soon as sinners spring up like grass and workers of iniquity appear, they will be thoroughly destroyed forever and ever. Sinners springing up like grass refers to passionate desires. For grass is a feeble thing and has no strength. And when passionate thoughts arise in the soul, therefore, they are brought to light. And this means that the workers of iniquity, the inordinate passions appear, in order that they can be completely destroyed forever and ever. For whenever passionate desire reappears in the mind, those who put up a fight, they, utterly, they are utterly and immediately rejected. So this here he's referring to in another sort of colorful metaphor, the topic of last week, right? Cutting off, or maybe two weeks ago, they're cutting off passionate desires at the beginning when they're small, with faith calling on the name of the Lord, but not giving them not giving them that power. He says if we if we're just if we have some courage to endure the, the what's coming to us with faith and trust in God, we call upon his name, these temptations they won't be allowed to grow into big uh, and, and serious uh, passions or burdens if you will um, I might describe it very often as for us something it's almost resentments can be a, a big one when we can get so unhappy about how things are, are working or, or not working I mean my own confession of just getting so upset at the DMV renewal you know, you have the, <laughs> You know, you have this whole system that you, you, you can't go there, and there's a new real ID which you need all these documents for, which are hard oh to goodness. hard to find. And, and none of this I'm so glad I did that before COVID. <laughs> yeah. oh my goodness. <laughs> but it, it's it just it's almost silly to allow myself to, to be be upset by it. You know, it's just you sometimes you just have to like, okay. Well, of course it's going to be a complex bureaucratic maze, and it's not going. It's the DMV. <laughs> you know, why should I expect it to be any different? And, and I think that's the hard thing. Is, yes, of course. I think that's a hard thing. Is, is like just thinking about myself. I get really worked up about, um, especially like dealing with my children, especially my oldest. I get very, very angry because it's like I just end up, like, and it's like. Well, why do I expect anything different from him? Because it's like, well, this is where he's at. I obviously, I can't let certain behavior persist, but I like have this thing of like, well, we should be done with this. Why are we still doing this? What's wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, well, why do I have that expectation? I think it's the whole, and like if I didn't have expectation, or if I, or, or if I expected, you know, this is gonna take the next 18 years. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's kind of it stop then. Right, it's like as if I if I have that expectation. Okay. Yeah, he's throwing. Yeah. Okay. Of... He is trying to bless his sister with her. Oh. Uh, so. oh. <laughs> but it's, 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 no, it's 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 very true, and um, because we want things to happen on our own timeline, in our own way, and we kind of want certain results. We have these comparisons that we make. Um, but every person is different. Every situation is different. Every struggle is, and you know, like God's perspective is bigger. It's like so much of this. We could just take those steps back metaphorically to get a bigger perspective, and we're able to do that. It's so much easier to be able to you know, just accept things as they are with faith. Um, again, not, don't take it the wrong way. Not that we are we ever are justifying. A sin or that we're trying to say that um, everything is perfect it's not <laughs> you know we know that but a, a lot of it's recognizing that nothing has power over me unless I give it power and that's and that's where it comes from um, I 
I participate in sin only if I choose to participate in sin, but also my peace of soul is destroyed only if I allow it to be. And that's where, um, that's where we can really find that true Christian philosophy that uh, Abba Dorotheos is, is uh, trying to uh, convey to us here. He says, consider now the consequences of the saying. First passion desires arise in the mind, then the underlying passion comes to light and they're destroyed. All this applies to contestants for the heavenly crown. For we who give way to the sins and are always satisfying our passions never recognize the passionate desires that spring up or the underlying passions that they reveal so that we can combat them. We remain under their sway in Egypt in the pitiful brick fields of Pharaoh. And who will give us the clear realization of our bitter slavery, so we may truly be humbled and eager to obtain mercy? Because this is where we're kind of stuck metaphorically in, in this Egypt, the state of enslavement, where so we don't even recognize the process. We first kind of have to come to, to see this, to become aware of it, to, uh, to have this holy struggle. And so we we'll jump ahead, but of course we're going to have a, our, our figurative Moses, right, who's going to lead, to, to lead us out. He says, so, so they, these represent, and he describes, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're figuratively building up these, these cities in, in Egypt, he says, which are, while well, we're enslaved, they represent luxury, avarice, or greed, right, and vainglory, so, because they pleasure, greed, and vanity. And from all these, from, from these, all different sins are derived. When God raised up Moses to lead them out of Egypt and deliver them from slavery to Pharaoh, the people of Israel were burdened with even greater labors by the king. And this is so, these are some interesting spiritual points he's making. So there's time to, for the people of Israel to be delivered. So if you know your Exodus well, well you'll see this. If not, be some reminders. And when, when uh, Moses first went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, Pharaoh said, no, in fact, I'm going to double their workload so the people will say, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll say, look what you've done to us, Moses. You've made our lives harder. Um, so Pharaoh first burdened them with greater labors by the king and said to them, you are worthless and lazy, and therefore you say, let us go and offer sacrifice to the Lord our God. In a like manner, when he knows that God intends to have mercy on his soul and relieve it of the burden of his evil passions, either by his word or through one of his servants, the devil aggravates them all the more and attacks them all the more vehemently. So he's saying, <laughs> so when we're at a point where we want to repent, we want to change our life, we want to really make a difference, sometimes the struggle gets stronger. We're facing more temptations. Don't get discouraged, that's to be expected, because the devil doesn't want you to be, uh, be freed from this, this slavery. Then he continues, but the fathers knowing this strengthen mankind with their teaching and do not allow us to fall prey to anxiety. One of them said, have you fallen? Rise up. And if it happens again and again and again, do the same. As we talked about, if you fall, get up again and again and again. Um, and another said, the strength of those who really want to acquire virtue is this. Even if they fall, they don't get discouraged. They get up and they go on thinking only of starting again. This is why it's so important to simply, um, in an uncomplicated way, to repent and to carry on. And even if, we're, if you're um, at a point where you're in the church, you go to confession, you don't have to feel like, oh, oh, it's just the same things again. Don't even psychoanalyze it on that level. Just simply confess, be free of it, and begin again. And that's sort of the, we, we want to get, we so overthink things as, as modern people. It's counterproductive. It doesn't do us any good. We want to acquire a simple childlike heart and simplicity. Um, because we could just let go of it. Think of it. We just, we just repent. And we start again. And we feel light happy <laughs> and uh, so there, there's, there's a bit of a side on there now each of the fathers quite simply each in his own special way holds out a hand to those who are in combat with the enemy and being attacked by him for they take as applying to themselves the words of holy scripture show not the fall and rise again 
Or shall not one who has turned away from me and turn back again? Return to me again, my children, I shall heal you from your wounds, says the Lord. And many others like it. And the hand of the Lord was heavy on Pharaoh and his attendants. They were unwilling to send the way of the sons of Israel. They said to Moses, um, so I'm going on. They, you know, Pharaoh said, no, you can't. Well, go, but leave your oxen and your sheep behind. And Moses said, well, no, we need them with, to take us with us to sacrifice. And then that's right. We don't want to be holding things back. You don't want to do it half part. You don't want to be repenting and still leaving figuratively some of your some of what you your your belongings in the possession of of the enemy who will then have something against you. He says, no, take it, take your whole self, and leave. And be freed. So don't, don't so don't turn back. Uh, when Moses did succeed in leading the sons of Israel out of Egypt, he took them across the Red Sea. Although God wanted to lead them to the 70 palm trees and the 12 fountains of water, he first led them to Marah, and the people were in distress since they found nothing to drink and the water was bitter. And from Marah, he brought them to 70 palm trees, the 12 fountains of water. And so he, what he shows is that, and he's gonna to continue to paraphrase, but their deliverance, so the imagery in the church from the earliest times, imagery of that deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt across the Red Sea, the Promised Land, is an image of baptism. It's an image of, of being freed from, from slavery, uh, of being freed from uh, sin, to beginning a new life through the water. A new life is possible. But do they immediately enter the Promised Land? No. The struggle begins. And it is a struggle in the desert. And also that in, in, in Mara, that image which is also very much held up during Great Lent, right? Because the people, they finally, they're dying of thirst in the desert, and they get waters, and they're bitter. And what does Moses put in the water to make it sweet? You want to remember? Does he put a stick in there? Yes, yes, a stick, a piece of wood. Cross. So, so in, the, in the understanding of the church, this, this, this stick, <laughs> this wood that he puts in, is an image of the cross, which makes the bitter waters become sweet. So, the, 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 in a sense, the same difficult trials and tribulations, hardships in our life, when, when brought through the cross, can actually become sweet, can become life-giving, can become salvific, the transforming. It says, so too the soul, when it stops committing sins, passes by the spiritual Red Sea, must first fight laboriously and be much afflicted, and then it comes out of affliction into a state of holy rest. Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven. For tribulations set the mercy of God in motion towards the soul, as the winds bring down rain. But too much rain coming down on delicate young plants makes them rot and destroys their fruit. A modest amount of wind dries out and stiffens them, so it is with the soul. Relaxation, freedom from care, and repose make it flabby. <laughs> <laughs> But temptations put it on its metal and united to God, as the prophet says. I mean, there, there is the flip side in, in, in the ascetic writings as well. We could say we have to, there is a time for a, a little spiritual relaxation. Um, there's an image, I think it's with, with St. Anthony in, in one of the great ascetic fathers with some of the younger, younger monks, and they were, um, in a sense, almost playing games or kind of taking relaxing. Someone came and was completely scandalized. But what he saw, what did you were probably monks in the desert, and he said, um, I think this was Anthony, I could have a different desert father. <laughs> but he said, basically, you know, take an arrow. I guess he had a, this lay person had a, had a bow and arrow with him. And he says, pull it, pu put the arrow in and pull it back. He says, okay. And pull it tighter. Okay. So pull it more, tighter. He said, well, so pull it more. He said, I can't pull it anymore, it will break. And he said, so it is too, at least with, the, with those who are, are younger, too much. Um, inten too much intensity, too much labor, all at once would, would cause them to break, to snap. That there is a proper time for a little, a little rest or relaxation of the tension, um, but then to continue. But I think our, our, our modern problem is probably more the opposite of Abba Dorotheos, is feeling like that, that, that we, want, we want to enter the kingdom of heaven laying on the couch, yeah. or, what, or what have you. So um, that's why he's trying to encourage us that to say that you know, total re relaxation, repose, is actually going to um, uh, to make the soul uh, <laughs> make the soul flabby. But temptations 
uh, put it on its metal and unite it to God. As the prophet says, the tribulations we were made mindful of you. So as we said, we must not let ourselves be mulled over or become slothful, but stand firm and give thanks in our tribulations. And pray to God with humility at all times, that he may have mercy on our weakness and protect us all in our temptations to the glory of his name. Um, I mean, how might we, might we sum it up? It's, it's more, don't, don't get discouraged. There's a lot of us saying. I had a quick, a quick question on those last, uh, that last paragraph or two on, uh, you know, about how relaxation and, uh, you know, all that make the soul, make the soul repose, make it flabby, that sort of thing. And I've, I've read a couple other things talking about how um, that it's good to remove ourselves from, from temptation and from all that, but if all we're doing is removing ourselves from temptation, but not fighting, not looking at analyzing our urge to sin, um, an example might be I don't know, let's say I'm, I'm mad at my brother. This was the, the, the story of my childhood, I'm mad at my brother. And instead of working on the problem and getting to the root of it and solving the problem with my brother, I just went to a different room. Mm -hmm. Then I'm no longer stewing furious at my brother, but I haven't really changed the fact that I have no ability to coexist with my brother. Yes. No, I think you've, you've hit on an important, I mean, an important point, and one of which I say relates a lot to what they talk about the benefit of living in a community, is that in some, some of these monastic rites, they, like, uh, somebody living alone, the hermit in the cave, can think that he's, uh, he's acquired all the virtues, but there's just really nothing revealing the passions inside of him. And the, but, if, but someone who's living closely with other people, there's lots of opportunities uh, to be tempted, to to uh, to be offended, to be to be in disagreement, and that's where um, the opportunity for growth is, and where we we have that you know sense with, with your brother, because we see that the the problem is not really with, with your brother, <laughs> the problem is with uh, how am I how am I reacting or responding uh, to that. Now, of course, for him it would be the opposite, but <laughs> but if we're taking this in the Christian in the Christian sense. Um, on my own, on my own walk with the Lord, in my own um, new journey to the kingdom, it is beneficial to have these, you know, some of these situations in our life, and to try to to grow through them. But so how do we, how do we take it? On one hand, we don't want to go seeking them out. That's not a Christian way. It's like we don't want to go, we don't want to go looking for martyrdom, because we might not be able to. To stay faithful to the end, and yet, if we're found, yet if God brings us to that point, He will give us the grace. If we just do it with humility. And in a lesser way, all of the hard things that we get, we don't have to go looking for difficulties. We're going to get them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's going to be okay. And the, there's a few other things that there are. It is good to set aside time in our day in our life when we really do have peace and quiet we need that because otherwise we're not going to, we have to be able to find that that place of deep uh, of stillness of peace with God of that grounding to be able to meet these these, these tribulations these difficulties um, so it also encourages that we don't want, you know don't imagine it's going to be like 24 7 we have to be right in the you know, in the fiery furnace so there's a, a sense in which it is, we may still have the, the difficulties. Sometimes we're going through a period of great um, you know, discouragement or, or depression, which is not uncommon at all right now for many people. Mm -hmm. And it could be a, an enormous effort even just to go to stand before the Lord a little bit. And yet if we do that, we can see the benefit is there. If we could just force ourselves to open the, open the Bible and read a little bit, we, we feel that it's... Maybe we, maybe we don't always even feel it, but experience shows that we that it's good for us. Uh, it's a lot better than just laying in bed, and for all of these 
Oh, all these ways. I know I'm kind of going far afield, but does that, does that help, help at all? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. Right. yeah. Anything else before we, we close today? So okay. you're saying like you summed it up, but yeah, so don't just, get discouraged. Don't discourage. I think that's the big part of this, is that it's, it's going to be hard, but God is with us in all of this. And if we if we don't try to change the circumstances, if our attention's not on, say, looking at the, pro the problem as somebody else or something else, um, whatever that may be, we often joke, it's, it's the governor or the president or the, or the agency or whoever, you know, whatever the abstract one is, or it's this person in, in my life, you know, who, who, who either in my house or I work with or whatever. And we just kind of ask for God's courage we ask for courage from him to to be faithful in all of these situations and we focus on giving thanks to him for all of this even thank him for the hardships because through this we're being saved through the hardships we're, we're learning the way of the cross we're learning we're drawing closer to to jesus christ even if it's a physical illness there's can sometimes be no uh, no greater way in which we, we taste of the cross in which we really enter into that experience of the Lord's passion, then, then a, a physical, then a, then a real illness, a physical hardship, and for one who can endure a great illness with faith and peace of soul, there sometimes is no greater Christian witness of a faith that has overcome death, that has transformed the world. Um, you know, sometimes we we could ask the Lord, help me to be a witness to it. And then he may, he may send us to be one in a way we really don't expect, right? We have this image of going out and preaching to people and lots of ones converting and then, but he may answer our prayer in ways that we, we don't foresee. So that's kind of more of the way in which, I'm not necessarily trying to like think something up and, and try to live that way, but, but to be faithful to God every day in the circumstances that we encounter. I guess that's probably the summary. Let's pray. It is truly me to bless thee, O Theosophon. Ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our God. For one of all men the cherubim. And more glorious be our condemned and the seraphim. Without corruption, thou givest us to God the way. To fail, to proceed, magnify thee. Amen.